Today's Thursday, June 24th, 2021. Uh, we are uh, working our way through the skeletal system, rapidly approaching the next exam. Uh, before we get to all of the game plans and everything, I do want to talk about the first exams. I uh, spent a tremendous amount of time yesterday trying to get as much of the grading done as possible. I wasn't able to get all of it done. Uh, and uh, likely will not get the rest of it done tonight either. So that means I won't get it done till this weekend. Uh, what I will do is uh, once I get them graded, I will post the grades uh, so that you can see what the grades on those are, but I will wait till Monday of next week to actually release the exams. I do think that it is important to be able to review your exams to learn what you did successfully and what could use improvement. Uh, but again, with this format, I can't leave them uh, open and available for the entire semester. So what will happen on um, Monday after class, I will uh, open up the exams for review. And then Tuesday morning when we're getting ready to start uh, class, I will go ahead and close them back down again. Uh, if you're not able to view them during those times or if you have questions and want to review them again, then I encourage you to come to my office hours uh, and I'm happy to discuss the exams with you. Like I said, I haven't fully finished grading them and I haven't put in the curve yet, so I don't know have numbers for you yet. But what I do have is some common trends, because uh, again, as we mentioned on Thursday, July 1st, you have your second exam and the format for that <clears throat> is going to be the same. And uh, despite my warnings, I know I say a lot of things, so it's easy for some of these things to get lost in the uh, ocean of babble that comes out of my mouth. But at the same time, some of the common errors uh, that I warned you guys about are still things that uh, did occur. Uh, for instance, uh, despite my warnings, a lot of you are losing a fair amount of points because you forgot to write left or right uh, when you were describing the acromial region or the brachial region or something along those lines. Again, as I mentioned, it is nothing more frustrating than you getting the region correct and then forgetting the right and left. So you, uh, there's some partial credit for that. Uh, so make sure you remember to spell things out. Don't just put ER. You have to write out endoplasmic reticulum uh, for those types of things. And for the essays, uh, for the questions in particular, make sure you are specific, make sure you are descriptive, explain things and compare things and do, you know, make sure you are addressing. If a question has three or four parts, make sure you're answering all three or four parts. There are a couple of people who did a really good job of answering the first part of a question and then forgot about the second and the third part. Uh, so again, these are uh, common mistakes, but they're also mistakes that easily can be addressed. Um, so make sure you're taking your time to do these things correctly and carefully. As I also mentioned, uh, during the exam, a fair number of people had problems uh, loading the images for the lab exam. Uh, as I said, uh, consistently the problems that I saw is either having to do with not having enough free RAM or uh, not having a good internet connection, uh, but enough people had issues with it where I changed the format of the lab exam to one question at a time. And uh, it seemed to work a lot better uh, for people uh, using that format. So that will be the format of the next lab exam as well. I will change the format again. Again, it's not my preferred way to do that uh, because I like the idea of you having all the questions at once to be able to look and go back. And technically you can go back when it's one question at a time, but you will sometimes get a warning uh, that it can affect stability of the exam and it can even get kicked out. Uh, you can, as you know, get back into the exam, but then you have to scan again and do all those things. So it is a pain, uh, but it is something that can do. And, and if it reduces the number of issues that we have, then uh, I think that that is worthwhile. All right, so like I said, I will have those available for you uh, as soon as I get them graded. I will, after class today, continue to grade. There's a slim chance I might be able to get them all done. And if I do, then I'll give them back tomorrow, open them up tomorrow, and, and we'll do it that way. But uh, don't hold your breath on it. We'll see how it goes. All right, so let's talk about today's game plan. Uh, today, like we're going to do for the rest of this section and lecture, we are going to talk about bone physiology. And then we'll switch gears in lab uh, for the group presentations, starting first today with the axial skeleton. Uh, there are four assignments that are due in this section, three unit reviews, and then the one 30-point skeletal review. 
Remember this skeletal review, unlike the unit reviews where I'm looking for completeness, I'm looking for time and effort spent on it. Uh, the 30 point skeletal review will be graded for correctness. And I believe because this is summer and everything gets accelerated to the nth degree, I believe that review, which shouldn't be available yet, uh, will be available today after class. So today after class, actually technically at noon, um, that will become available for you to be able to start looking at. Uh, but again, I encourage you not to spend too much time on it yet because you haven't learned the bones and bone features. So you can't know what bone and bone features relates to a second bone and bone feature if you haven't learned the first and the second bone feature. Hopefully uh, going over those things today will be a good start to that process. All leading up to Thursday, uh, July 1st, when we will have our second lab and lecture exam. Uh, then we come back on Friday and uh, start the muscular system. Uh, then we have a holiday and then we dive back in more is more. So again, the other thing point that I would like to make with this is because the way this schedule works out, this weekend is your big weekend to study for the exam. Yes, you will also have Wednesday the 30th uh, as a day off to be able to study, but that means you have basically three days off to study all the material we're going to be covering now and uh, next week as well. So again, welcome to summer school, but also uh, make sure you are putting time and effort into these things. I know the last thing you want to do after you've sat here and listened to me yammer for four and a half hours is spend more time studying this material, but unfortunately that's what we have to do on summer school. So uh, don't just save yourself for the weekends to do your studying because you don't have many days off between now and the next exam. All right, questions on any of that? No. Excellent. All righty, then let's go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, we have a lot of bones and bone features that we are going to be responsible for learning. But as we also talked about, bone is a very dynamic tissue. And our bones, the organs, are very dynamic as well. So there is a lot of physiology we're going to talk about for this section. Uh, obviously, the first thing we have to talk about with bones is how you make a bone. After all, we all go from that first egg and that first sperm that come together to form, what was that cell that the sperm and the egg form again? Zygote. A zygote, excellent. From that single-celled zygote, we have to divide not just trillions of times to make us, but uh, we have to uh, start to differentiate some of those cells. And in that process, we are gonna make bones. Now, of course, as we know, being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, uh, we are going to learn two methods for making bones. So how many essay questions does that relay itself to? Three. Three, absolutely. Four. Describe process one, describe process two, and compare the two processes. Excellent. So our first goal is going to be to make bones. Once we make bones, as we talked about in the last class, I think we confirmed that nobody is the same size right now as they were when they were born. So we have to grow our bones. And guess how many ways there are to grow bones? One. Close, Three. double that. Two. Two, there you go, exactly. Grow them in length and grow them in width. And of course, if we have two related growth processes, guess how many possible essay questions there are for that? Three. Three, comparing those, excellent. However, as we also talked about, most of us are now at the point where our uh, bones are at their mature size. And now that they're at the mature size, are they just done? They stop growing, they're just big dead sticks inside of our body that don't do anything. No, of course not. We need to be able to maintain the bones. And we'll talk about the three main characteristics that are necessary to be able to maintain our bones. Uh, and then of course, as we also talked about, we then occasionally will break those bones and we have to worry about ways to repair them as well. Lastly, 
as we also talked about, we can't talk about bones without talking about the effect that calcium has on our bones and the relationship between bone homeostasis and calcium homeostasis. Because as we talked about, if it comes to a choice in your body of having the right amount of calcium or having big, thick, strong bones, what wins every time? Calcium in your body. Calcium in the body. So when it comes to uh, maintaining our bones, at the same time we're trying to maintain our bones, we are also maintaining appropriate calcium levels. And sometimes that can be detrimental to bone growth and development. So we'll talk about that as well. All right. Because again, as we talked about, something like 99% of the body's calcium is stored in our bone matrix and calcium makes the cells do wonky things. So controlling calcium levels in our body are hugely important. All right, so that's the game plan. Let's start first with making of our bones. As it turns out, as that single zygote is developing into an embryo, uh, that embryo basically doesn't have a bony skeleton yet its skeleton is primarily made up of two types of connective tissues. Now, again, these are embryonic tissues, so they're not 100% similar to, uh, to adult tissues. So one of them is a fibrous connective tissue. We won't worry about trying to identify it. And then hyaline cartilage. So two different types of tissues make up our embryonic skeleton. And how many different methods did I say we had for making bones? Two. Two. Think that's a coincidence? No. No, of course not. So one of the ways we're going to make a bone is out of a fibrous connective tissue. The other way we're going to make a bone is out of hyaline cartilage. This process of making bone is a process we call osteogenesis. Osteo, of course, means bone. Genesis, to give birth to, or ossification, right? This is the way we form bone. This process begins relatively early in the developmental process, right? About week seven or six, right? So again, usually around week 10 is when you have your first ultrasound and you can already start to see the ribs, see the bones of the vertebrae and stuff like that when you're getting that uh, first, um, ultrasound. And as I mentioned, with two types of connective tissues, we are going to have two ways of forming bone. The first of those is endochondrial ossification. Endo, of course, means what? In. In. Chondrial refers to? Cartilage. Cartilage. So within our cartilage, so again, that highland cartilage model we we're going to use, and intramembranous. Intra, of course, means within. Membranous means a membrane. So within that fibrous connective tissue. So two different types of connective tissues, two different ways of making bones. All right. Questions on that? Negative. Hey. All right, excellent. We are going to talk about endochondrial ossification first. It's a little bit more of an elaborate process, uh, but before we can talk about endochondrial ossification, notice what we've got here. Endochondrial ossification occurs within a hyaline cartilage model. Basically what this means is we have a chunk of cartilage basically in the shape of the bone that we want, and we are then going to turn it into bone. But the question becomes then, how do we make a chunk of cartilage in the shape of the bone we want? And so before we can talk about endochondrial ossification, right, we have to talk about methods of growth. Again, the same way when we talked about skin, we talked about regeneration and fibrosis. Is skin the only place regeneration and fibrosis takes place? No. No. Every tissue in our body uh, is going to use either regeneration or fibrosis to repair when it is injured. And it's the same thing here. These growth methods we're going to talk about in this formation of our highland cartilage model. But is cartilage the only place where these types of growth methods uh, occur? 
No. no. And even in cartilage, we're going to use it in multiple ways. Because again, when we think of biology, when we think of life, life is lazy. Once it invents a wheel, once it's figured out a way to do something, it's going to use that method as many times as possible. There's no point in reinventing the wheel when we already have a system that works pretty well. And that's what we're going to see here with these growth prep methods. Yes, we're going to talk about it in the Highland cartilage to make our big model to be able to turn it into a bone. But there's lots of other places where we are going to use this growth method as well. Now, obviously, to make more connective tissue, we need more cells. And those more cells, of course, because we're talking about connective tissues, are going to come from the mesenchymal cells. Remember, our mesenchymal cells are the pluripotent stem cells. That produce all of the cells for connective tissues. In this case, they're forming our immature chondroblasts, and those chondroblasts are going to make our matrix. Here we have our finished highland cartilage model. Notice it's going to be in the basic shape of a bone, having a diaphysis, having two epiphyses. And as we also know, highland cartilage has a dense irregular connective tissue around the outer surface that houses the immature cells. That dense irregular connective tissue, based on its location, the fact that it is sitting on top of a cartilage, so throw a BOL over here, based on its location, we call it a perichondrium. This isn't new information, we kind of know that. Notice we have mature cells, the chondrocytes, living inside of lacunas. So let's take a closer look at this. Oh, yeah, that's what I want. Okay, perfect. Let's go to our whiteboard. These are our method, method, blah, 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 methods of growth. Again, I'll put in parentheses here for our cartilage because that is how we're using it right here. But remember, these are growth methods that can be used by any tissue. So actually, let's do it this way. Growth methods for our cartilage that can be used for any Excellent. And as we talked about, there are two types. So let's get our starting point. Our starting point here is a chunk of highland cartilage. And inside that highland cartilage, we of course have a lacuna. And of course, inside of that lacuna, we have a chondrocyte. So here's our matrix of our highland cartilage. Here is our lacuna, make this a little smaller. And of course, here is our chondrocyte. Our mature cell that is hanging out here. inside of our matrix. All right. Now, this first type of growth is what is called interstitial growth. With interstitial growth, what happens is we make more matrix within the tissue. As the name would indicate, interstitial, it is within the tissue. Notice this was not something that bone did. And the reason bone does, isn't able to do it because what happens here in our cartilage is that our chondrocyte in the lacuna 
divides. Remember, an osteocyte is not capable of dividing, but a chondrocyte is. So one chondrocyte becomes two chondrocytes. And two chondrocytes are now hanging out in this same lacuna. Uh, as you know, I have two daughters. And when they were young, we had them in the same bedroom because my wife liked to use the other bedroom for a craft room so she could do all of her fun things. And so we lumped the girls together in their own room. However, as they grew and get, oh, get got, let me try that again. As they grew and got older, did they necessarily like sharing the same room? No. Yeah. And the same thing happens with these chondrocytes. What starts to happen with these chondrocytes is they start making new matrix. So they will start surrounding themselves with new matrix. And as they surround themselves with new matrix, what ends up happening is they push away from each other. By making more matrix in the middle, they push away from each other until ultimately they are finally in their own lacunas. So they keep making more and more matrix. Oops, no, undo that. Building more and more matrix, filling the spaces in between them with more and more matrix until they have um, separated from each other and are now have their own living spaces. Notice as they're doing this, they're pushing out on their surroundings. And as they push out on their surroundings, the overall matrix model gets bigger. So this expands out and everything gets bigger as a result of this. So our chondrocytes divide, they make new matrix within the model. Then they expand the tissue from within until they are in separate lacunas, lacunae. And then, of course, the process continues. Now, again, I appreciate my drawing of this is not the best. But if we take a look at the pretty picture from your textbook, uh, we can see they've done a nicer job of showing this. Notice here with our interstitial growth, we have a little chunk of cartilage and our single chondrocyte divides to become two chondrocytes. These two chondrocytes start making matrix, surrounding themselves with matrix, separating and pushing away from each other. And as they push away from each other, the entire matrix model, which went from something here, let's totally cheat, All right? This was the size of the model before. And now that they've been pushing away from each other, we have been able to expand the tissue in all directions uh, by these cells pushing away from each other by making new matrix within the model, within the tissue. All right. Questions on that? I'm sorry, go ahead. So is there a, some sort of cleavage furrow equivalent that occurs between the cells? Uh, so obviously when the cells divide, yes, cytokinesis is going to have to occur. This, this division process that occurs in the cells is absolutely mitosis. So it has prophase, it has metaphase, it has anaphase, it has telophase to make two cells. So yes, the division of it, the cell is going to use mitosis. So we have two complete cells. But then once they're the complete cells, they are making matrix. So they're just filling the tissue with more matrix to push away from each other. Yeah. All right. Hopefully this one's pretty straight, simple and straightforward. Questions on that? Now, as I mentioned, life is lazy. And so once it learns how to do something, it's gonna to want to do it more than just the once. This is gonna be really good from taking a small chunk of cartilage and expanding it into a bone shape model that we'll be able to use to make a bone. But 
If you remember, we have a structure in a long bone called the epiphyseal plate. And what was that epiphyseal plate made out of again? Island car cartilage. Island cartilage. And what did we say that epiphyseal plate was used for? Growing it long ways. Exactly. The way a bone grows in length is this exact same process. In that epiphyseal plate, the chondrocytes divide, they make new matrix, and they push the head of the bone away from the shaft of the bone. So this exact same growth process, this interstitial growth, is also going to be how we grow the bones in length. All right, so if we go back to our pretty picture, we can add that one last comment here. Also, how the bone grows in length. All right. Excellent. That is our interstitial growth. Now, let's talk about our second growth process. The second growth process is called appositional. With appositional growth, what happens is we add new layers of matrix to the outside of the tissue. Now, of course, we need a way to do that. And lucky for us, remember our immature cells, mesenchymal cells, and the chondroblasts, remember, are located under the, um, and, uh, the perichondrium. So we've looked at the inside of this matrix, but let's take a peek at the outside. As we know, there is a chondrocyte on the outer surface, normally in direct contact. I'm purposely drawing it outward because it serves my purpose to do so. And I'm going to give it even more space here. Close enough. And we know underneath here are the immature cells, those mesenchymal cells housed here underneath the perichondrium, this dense irregular connective tissue that's on the outer surface. And we'll put one there as well. Now, of course, as we know, these mesenchymal cells can divide. And when they divide, they produce in this case, a chondroblast. And of course, what do chondroblasts do? Create the matrix. Yeah, exactly. This chondroblast is going to make matrix. And so it is going to surround itself with matrix. And as it surrounds itself with matrix, it's going to form a lacuna where it matures into a chondrocyte. And is there just one mesenchymal cell in here producing just one chondroblast? No. No, of course not. So other chondroblasts are going to form here on the outer surface. And as these other chondroblasts form on the outer surface, they are going to make and surround themselves with matrix. And as they make and surround themselves with matrix, notice, lo and behold, I have added a new layer of a matrix underneath our periosteum, which of course is going to expand outward to make space for new ones. And then again, there's still more mesenchymal cells, which will divide to produce new chondroblasts. And these new chondroblasts will make more matrix and in this process, step by step, we make more and more matrix on the outer surface of our tissue. So notice in this case, we are expanding the tissue by adding new layers 
under the perichondrium. Right. And the fact that I can manipulate this and pull the, the, uh, the tissue out and expand, it makes it a little bit easier here. But again, your book's got a pretty picture that shows this process as well. Notice here is the old cartilage. Here are the uh, mesenchymal cells dividing to produce the chondroblasts. Those chondroblasts are surrounding themselves with matrix. And this process continues. More chondro uh, chondroblasts form those chondroblasts uh, fill the space with matrix and we continue to add more layers of matrix on the outer surface of our cartilage model. All right, questions on that. All right, notice again, adding more and more layers on the outer surface. And as we also know, life is lazy. It has this system that works pretty well. And remember, we talked about the growth of the bone has to grow in two directions. We now know interstitial growth can be used to grow our bones in length. But remember, we also have to grow our bones in width. And guess what growth process we use to grow bones in width? Not a trick question. Appositional. Yeah, appositional, absolutely. Basically, we are going to add new layers of bone on the outer surface of the bone. And as we add those new layers of bone on the outer surface of the bone, our bone is going to get wider. So this is also how not only we increase the width of our cartilage, but also how we increase the width of our bone. And one other important thing, let's do this in red to make sure it stands out. Use the growth process to grow bones in width. And this is also how we form osteons. Remember, osteons are the organizing structures of our compact bone. So we could also say this is also how we form compact bone. Without this process, without this appositional growth, we don't get compact bone. So there you go. Two very, very important growth processes, appositional growth and interstitial growth. And like I said, here we're using it to make our cartilage model, but remember it can be used for any of the types of tissues in our body. So these are growth methods that are important, just like regeneration and fibrosis, even though we're not talking about skin anymore, are still gonna be important growth processes as well. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So using those two growth processes, we can form our cartilage model that we are going to use to make our bone. So again, hopefully this stuff is clear. If this stuff's not clear, it's just gonna get worse. So I'll ask one last time. Any questions on this before we move forward? All right, excellent. And then I'm going to go ahead and clear this so that we can focus on our first major process of bone formation, and that is endochondrial ossification. Like we've done in the past, I think it is very important to make sure you understand this process. So to do so, how are we on time? Perfect. Uh, to do so, I'm gonna go through this process twice. For the first time, I just wanna go through it on the board here. Uh, for this, I want you to just watch and think and listen and focus on the process that we're talking about. 
And then from there, uh, we'll go through all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words, and you can write as much as you want uh, for that second part. Now, endochondrial ossification is the process that is used to make most of the bones of the body. However, as we know, bones of the body come in lots of different shapes and sizes and flavors. Also, endochondrial ossification is used for all long bones. And since we have a good understanding of the anatomy of our long bones, I think our long bones is a good place to go ahead and start. So we will focus on our uh, formation of endochondrial ossification and look at that process in a long bone. Now, of course, to start this process, we need to start with our cartilage model. So here is our cartilage model. And as we know, our cartilage model is going to have uh, that diaphysis and then the epiphysis that comes off of it. There's one there and there's one there, giving us our basic bone shape. Maybe that last one could be a little bigger, give us a little more pronounced epiphysis. Okay, drawing is horrible, but that works. And as we also know, there is a perichondrium around the outer surface of this. Again, it should be in direct contact. I'm purposely giving us a little space. So we have some playroom. All righty. So let's wiggle this out a little bit more. Give myself a little bit more room here on the top. As we know, here in the perichondrium, there are some mesenchymal cells. And those mesenchymal cells are dividing to produce new chondroblasts. Those chondroblasts are adding more matrix on the outer surface and we are growing our cartilage and we're happily growing and expanding our cartilage model. And this is our starting point. However, oh, oh, forgot one more thing. We can't forget about uh, the fact that we have Be a little too big. Chondrocytes happily living inside of this, dividing and making more matrix from within as well, allowing us to expand the tissue from the inside and expand the tissue from the outside. And let's cheat. Move this one a little closer. All right. Now that is our starting point. We have hyaline cartilage, we have lacunas, we have chondrocytes, we have mesenchymal cells producing chondroblasts on the outer surface, and it is happily chugging along making this cartilage material. But our goal is to make bone. Now, as we know, mesenchymal cells are pluripotent stem cells. Remind me again what that means. Uh, it's a stem cell that can make a small variety of specialized cells. Exactly. And in this case, mesenchymal cells can make any cells associated with connective tissues. So we come back to that issue we've talked about before. How does the mesenchymal cell know what type of cell to make? Hormones. Yeah, hormones and other chemical signals, exactly. So right now these mesenchymal cells are making chondroblasts. I need to make a bone. So I need to get this mesenchymal cell to make a different type of cell. And I need to do that, I need to give it a different chemical signal. I need to change the environment. Right? That's really the key to the start of this process. I need to change the environment. 
and really change the chemical signals. So that my mesenchymal cells will do something other than make cartilage. So how can I do that? How can I bring another different chemical signal to this perichondrium? Oh, and let's write that because we forgot to do that. This is indeed our perichondrium. Can't forget that. So while I'm writing this, someone tell me how we can change the environment, change the chemical signal. Think of it this way. What's one of the biggest differences between bone and cartilage? I mean, strength, obviously, that's the... Uh, Definitely the one of the big ones, yep. How about rate of repair? Are those similar? No. Do bone and cartilage repair at the same rate? Why not? Cartilage is avascular. Bingo. One of the biggest differences between bone and cartilage is vascularization. And what's a great way to bring new chemical signals to an environment? A blood vessel. And that's exactly what happens. To start the change, to start the process of making bone, what happens is a blood vessel grows into the perichondrium. So the very first thing that's gonna happen is a blood vessel grows in the perichondrium bringing new chemical signals. And these new chemical signals cause the mesenchymal cells to instead of dividing to make chondroblasts, start to divide to make osteoblasts. And of course, what do osteoblasts do? Deposit matrix onto the hyaline cartilage. Yeah, so they're going to form that osteoblast. They're going to form a bit of matrix, and as they form that bit of matrix, uh, they're going to more. They're going to surround themselves in a lacuna. They are going to uh, be mature into an osteocyte, and what's going to end up happening is we are going to start to form a layer of bone on the outer surface of this cartilage model. Oops, no. I want that there. I want that. So I can start to draw this layer of bone matrix. And this layer of bone matrix that form is called the bone collar or the bone cuff that is gonna form on the outer surface of our cartilage model. All right, so far so good? Excellent. Now I do have one question. Notice this dense irregular connective tissue was called a perichondrium because it was sitting on top of cartilage. Is it sitting on top of cartilage anymore? No. No, what's it sitting on now? Bone. Bone. So in this case, what's going to happen is our perichondrium becomes what? Perichondrium. There you go. Our perichondrium becomes an osteum. Notice the tissue hasn't changed. What it contains hasn't changed. The only thing that has changed is what it's sitting on. But that's how we give it its location name. We give it a location name based on what it's sitting on. And in this case, it's now sitting on bone. So it's no longer a perichondrium. Now it's a periosteum. Does the bone wrap all the way around the cartilage or is it just on the shaft? Just on it the starts side? just on the shaft, as we'll see. It's it primarily this bone cuffer collar primarily just forms on the diaphysis. All the changes that are taking place start here on the diaphysis. All right, excellent. So first big change. Blood vessel grows in, we start to form that bone collar on the outer surface of our cartilage model. 
At the same time, changes are occurring inside. Remember before those chondrocytes were dividing and making more matrix. And as we talked about during interphase, one of the things that a cell has to do is it has to grow big before it can divide. Well, what starts to happen here in the diaphysis is the chondrocytes grow big and become very metabolically active. but they don't divide. So what starts to happen is that these chondrocytes start growing really, really big and becoming very, very active. Now, there isn't anything inherently wrong with a cell growing very big and very active, except for the fact that if the cell grows big, the chondrocyte, uh, pardon me, the lacuna around it has to obviously get bigger as well to contain it. And as these lacunas get bigger, notice what happens to the amount of matrix in between. The matrix in between these starts to thin. And not only does it start to thin, so we have this thinning of the matrix that comes in, but the matrix starts to harden as well. So as these cells become big and really metabolically active, the matrix around them thins and hardens. And if it thins and hardens, are these cells gonna have an easier time or a harder time getting the oxygen and the nutrients that they need, getting rid of wastes? It's harder time. So as a result of this, it makes it harder for them to get oxygen, harder for them to get nutrients, harder for them to get rid of wastes. And these cells are really metabolically active. So if you're really metabolically active and you're not able to get the oxygen you need, is that a good environment to be in? No. no. And so as a result of this, the chondrocytes actually die. And when those chondrocytes die, they just leave this hollowed out hardened matrix cavity. And this cavity forms in the center of our diaphysis. All right, questions on that. Excellent. Now, we have this perfectly nice cavity in space there and do, does life like a vacuum? No. No, if we have a cavity, we wanna fill it with something. And in this case, what we're gonna to wanna to fill it with is bone. Of course, to make bone in there, we're gonna to need to bring new cells and new chemical signals to do that. And what might a good way to bring new cells and new chemical signals to the center of this bone be? To bring in blood vessels. Exactly. There is going to be a blood vessel that grows into this environment. And actually let's cheat. I'm gonna bring this stuff over here a little bit. Move it out of my way. So what happens is a large blood vessel. This large blood vessel is known as the nutrient artery. Grows into the center of the diaphysis. If we were actually in the classroom and you got a chance to actually hold real bones in your hand, uh, you would notice that every long bone that you look at 
has at least one of these holes in the center of its diaphysis where that first nutrient artery grew in. Now, some really, really big bones like the femur might have multiple, but everyone has at least one, even the tiny little long bones in your fingers. So this nutrient artery grows into the area, bringing new chemical signals and new cells. And when this occurs, we are gonna start to form bone in the center part of this diaphysis. Now, is this bone gonna be perfectly aligned, uh, concentric circles, central canals, compact bone here in the center? No, spongy. No, exactly. There you go, Samuel's got it. No, what's gonna happen here is a small chunk of spongy bone forms in the center. And because anatomists love to name everything, this small chunk of spongy bone that forms in the center is called the primary ossification center. And of course, why is it the primary? It's the first one. Exactly, it's the first one. Oops, our bone is black. It's the first one that forms. So we get this compact bone pardon me, spongy bone that forms here in the center, this primary ossification center. And once we form this small amount of spongy bone, are we gonna be content with that? No, it's gonna to continue to expand towards the epiphyses. So we're going to get the expansion of that primary ossification center. Excellent. Notice we're doing a really good job of making our diaphysis look like bone, where it was cartilage before. But does it look like the mature long bone that we've seen? No. So the one thing that we still need to do is basically we need to do this remodeling of the diaphysis. All right? What do we know about the characteristics of the diaphysis? Longer than it is wider. True, that part we got though, right? It has a, medulla, a medullary cavity. Excellent, absolutely. One of the things that we need to do is we need to hollow out most, not all, remember there's still gonna be a little bit of spongy bone around the sides, most of the spongy bone to form the medullary cavity. All right, but we have all that bone there. If only there was a type of cell that we had that was capable of removing bone matrix. Does such a cell exist? Osteoclasts. There you go. Excellent. So our osteoclasts are going to come in. And as our osteoclasts come in, uh, let's do that. They are going to start to hollow. Actually, let's totally cheat. They are going to hollow out most of the spongy bone that is in here, forming the medullary cavity. And of course, once we form the medullary cavity, what are we gonna to wanna to do with that medullary cavity? We're gonna to wanna to fill it with something. What do we wanna fill it with? Uh, red bone marrow. There you go. Absolutely. So that blood vessel, which I broke, there we go, is going to then fill this space with red bone marrow. But there's one other thing we need our diaphysis to be. Yes, we need it to be hollow, 
but we also need it to be really, really strong. So we remember we need to make that thick outer layer of compact bone to give that diaphysis its strength. And so the way we do that is, again, as we talked about under the periosteum, uh, we form many layers of compact bone. So we're going to be thickening that bone, forming a thick layer of compact bone on the outer surface. Thin layer of spongy bone on the inside and a big cavity filled with red bone marrow. Is that what our diaphysis of a mature long bone looks like? Yeah. Absolutely, mission accomplished. We have made the diaphysis of this long bone look the way we want it to look. What about the connective tissue in, in the uh, spongy book inside? Well, so remember, here in the diaphysis, remember, we do have a little bit of spongy bone that is lining the inner surface, because remember, those osteoclasts don't remove all of it. But I understand what you're asking me. We haven't done anything with the epiphyses yet, right? And remember, as we talked about, this process starts early. Remember, we talked about week uh, six or seven is when uh, this process begins. And so this part ends relatively early. But notice we haven't done anything with those two epiphyses yet. As it turns out, the formation of the epiphyses occurs much later. In fact, it typically occurs either just before or in some cases, slightly after birth takes place. Right. For those of you who have ever held a newborn baby in, their, in your arms, how flexible are the fingers of a newborn baby? Very flexible. Very. Very flexible, right? I'm not encouraging to bend them all the way back and roll them up, but you actually could if you wanted to. Don't, but you could if you wanted to, right? So the formation of the epiphyses occurs much, much later. However, our goal is still the same. We have cartilage and we need bone. And as we know, life is lazy. So not surprisingly, the same thing is going to occur. Basically, and that is the key word here, the same process occurs in the epiphysis just much later. All right? Let's write it out first and then we'll draw the pretty pictures. Chondrocytes grow and die. That gives us a cavity. Once we have a cavity, what needs to happen? Fill it with bone marrow. Blood vessel. blood vessel grows in. Once that blood vessel grows in, what's gonna happen? Osteo, or the spongy. All right, osteoblasts form and make spongy bone. So notice the process begins the same. The same process is going to occur. We have here, uh, whoops, that's way too thick. We have our chondrocytes that are gonna get, grow big. When they grow big, they die. I'm not gonna bother drawing the circles to just remove them again. Then a blood vessel grows into the environment. This blood vessel basically grows up from the neck region. So not surprisingly, it is called the epiphyseal artery that grows in. And actually let's grow it in from up here so that it doesn't get too crowded down there below. 
grows into the environment. When it grows into the environment, osteoblasts are going to form and those osteoblasts are gonna to start to fill this space with spongy bone. So the process begins the same, right? It's basically the same process, but basically doesn't mean that it's identical. There are some big differences, right? What are the big differences in the process? The space doesn't get hollowed out. Excellent. One of the big ones is no medullary cavity. So as a result of this, it stays compact, sorry, stays spongy bone in the center. Excellent. There's one other really, really big difference. What's the other big difference? So we're gonna fill this with spongy bone. Are we gonna, gonna blah, blah, blah. Are we gonna convert the entire epiphysis to bone or do we actually wanna keep some of this uh, uh, cartilage in this structure? Yes. Yeah, and the, the other big difference is we don't convert all the cartilage to bone. In fact, there are two places we want to keep the hyaline cartilage. Some of that hyaline cartilage is going to be maintained here in the metathesis. And why might we want to keep this hyaline cartilage in the metathesis? For the epithelial plate. Yeah, exactly. For the growth and length for the to form the epiphyseal plate. We're also going to want to leave some of the hyaline cartilage on the outer surface of the bone. And why might we want to leave some hyaline cartilage on the outer surface of the bone? <laughs> to connect with joints. Yeah, to form the cartilage. Exactly. So the other big difference, one, was that we leave it spongy bone, we don't hollow out the medullary cavity. And the second is we do not convert, well, actually, yes, there's three big differences. We'll get to that in a second. Do not convert all of uh, the cartilage into bone. Uh, we keep some in the uh, metaphysis to form the growth plate. Plate to grow in planks. And we keep some on the outer surface to form the articular cartilage. to form our joints. There you go. And of course, as I mentioned, obviously the third uh, big difference is the timing. Right, this uh, epiphysis forms basically slightly before or even after birth takes place, whereas in our medullary cavity, this forms very early in the process. Now notice also at the beginning of this process, right here, when we start to form this spongy bone in the center, we get a little nugget of spongy bone that is forming in here. And guess what we call this little nugget of spongy bone that forms in the epiphyses, helping us to convert that cartilage into bone? It is the secondary ossification center. Now, of course, why is it called the secondary ossification center? Because it came second after the primary. Second, exactly. Primary comes first, second becomes comes second. However, the other thing that helps me to remember it is how many primary ossification centers do we form? One. One for, for primary means one, 
and one primary ossification center forms. Secondary means second. And how many secondary ossification centers are we going to form? Two. Two, one in each epiphysis. So that's the other way I remembered as well. Primary forms in the one diaphysis, secondary form in the two epiphyses. And when this process is done, I now have formed my bone. Starting with a chunk of cartilage, I have made a bone. Questions on that? Yes, Professor. Uh, yes. All of the, the wording and down on the bottom of the screen, can you mm -hmm. possibly move those up? I, I don't know if it, it's only mine that gets cut off or everybody else's too. Uh, how much is cut off? Uh, the bottom line, yeah. That, that's good. And the right side one. Perfect. There you go. Is that better? Now you can see everything? Yes, thank you. Excellent. All righty. Any other questions? I had a question. Yeah. Um, the cartilage inside the bone, uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned it. Is that also high, highland cartilage? So what's left, yes. Remember the epiphyseal plate mm -hmm. and the articular cartilage are both highland cartilage, so yes. So those are areas, and again, notice we don't have to make the hyaline cartilage, it started as hyaline cartilage. So really we just leave that little bit of hyaline cartilage there. We don't convert it to bone and then that serves our purpose. So we don't have to actually make hyaline cartilage there, we just leave it and don't convert it. Okay, thank you. Yep, good. Any other questions? Can you save this image? Yep, I already did. I just did. And I will post this, including the growth processes. And then we do, when we do intramembranous ossification, I will save that one and post it as well. All right. Big process, important process. Again, definitely one of three possible essay questions. Essay question one, possible. Describe process endo, endochondrial ossification. And this would be it. Notice. I did it in what, five steps? I think your book does it in six or something like that. I don't know. I don't care about the number of steps. I just care that you describe and have all of the detail. If I had anything else that I see that I'm writing a lot on these lecture exam essay questions is to be specific and be descriptive. Give me details. I don't want just, you know, the Cliff Notes version of this. Again, if I'm going to narrow the information you're responsible for, you have to show me you've mastered it by the depth of understanding. And the way you show me depth of understanding is being by being specific and giving me details. All right, excellent. So let's go ahead and leave this on here, uh, digest this for a few minutes, and then we'll take our first break. And then when we come back from our break, we'll go through the pretty picture of it in the textbook. And then we'll also then do our second growth process, intramembranous ossification. And then just to make sure we understand them, we'll also compare the two as well. Looks like it is 9.20 right now. So let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, we will come back at, uh, that'll be 9.35. And I will start the recording at that point. All righty. Any questions? Negative. All right. I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All righty. We have done endochondrial ossification here on the whiteboard, as I mentioned. Let's go ahead and go through the process again with the pretty pictures from your textbook. So again, we start with that hyaline cartilage model with a perichondrium on the outer surface. And again, starting around week six or seven of embryonic development, we start changing what is being produced here. And how do we change that? We bring new chemical signals. And how do we do that? We grow a blood vessel into the perichondrium. If you notice, this, like many of the processes, is a long-ish process. We're definitely it will be some longer processes we're talking about. But really, if you think about it, it's the same thing that basically happens three times. 
A blood vessel grows into the environment, uh, bringing new cells, new chemical signals, and we make bone. And so first it starts in the perichondrium. Here in the perichondrium, new blood vessel grows in, bringing a new chemical signal, causing osteoblasts to form. An osteoblast is gonna do what an osteoblast is gonna do, makes bone. We get this shell or bone collar on the outer surface. And because it's sitting underneath the perichondrium, now the perichondrium is no longer sitting on cartilage, it is sitting on bone. So of course our perichondrium becomes a periosteum. All right. Questions on that? All right. Nope. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you said no. I'll just, I'll just. Got it. Excellent. All right. Now, while those changes are occurring on the outside of our cartilage model, changes are occurring on the inside as well. Remember, those chondrocytes that were dividing to make new matrix before are still getting big, but they're no longer dividing and they become really metabolically active, All right? So we get these really large chondrocytes that form in the center. And again, there's nothing wrong with a large chondrocyte. The problem is that it thins the matrix around them and the matrix around them hardens, it starts to calcify. And as that cartilage starts to calcify, those chondrocytes can't get the oxygen, can't get the nutrients that they need anymore. And so those chondrocytes die. And what that leaves behind is this nice big cavity at the center of our diaphysis. Now that we have a cavity, life doesn't like cavities, doesn't like a void, so it wants to fill it. To fill it, we need new cells, we need new chemical signals. So now for a second time, a blood vessel grows into that cavity. This particular blood vessel, as we mentioned, is called the nutrient artery, grows in the center of our diaphysis, bringing new chemical signals, bringing new cells, and we start to get the formation of osteoblasts, which form a big chunk of spongy bone at the center of this diaphysis. And what do we call that big chunk of spongy bone at the center of our diaphysis? Cavity. Well, true, it's forming in the cavity, but what would we call the chunk of spongy bone that forms there? The primary ossification center. There you go, excellent. Okay. So we get that formation of the primary ossification center that is gonna form at the center. And that primary, that primary ossification center that forms there in the center, does it just stay there in the center? Happy and content as a little nugget? No, it expands. Yeah. It's gonna grow out, it's gonna expand out towards the epiphyses. Doesn't get to the epiphyses, but it is gonna fill the diaphysis. And indeed, it fills the diaphysis with spongy bone, which is awesome because we're getting bone and that is our goal. However, is our goal to have a diaphys diaphysis that is just filled with spongy bone? No. No. So we need to then modify or remodel the diaphysis, right? Our primary ossification center expands and fills the diaphysis, but now osteoclasts start to form. And as they form, they remove most, but not all of the, uh, of the spongy bone. Notice there's still a little bit of spongy bone that is lining the medullary cavity as we've seen, but it hollows out most of the spongy bone forming that medullary cavity which as you guys mentioned, we are now gonna fill with red bone marrow. 
At the same time, we need the shaft of this to be able to be strong, to be able to support the stress that we're gonna be putting on these long bones. So notice also we start to form this thick layer of compact bone on the outer surface. So we get a thick layer of compact bone on the outer surface, thin layer of spongy bone, a medullary cavity filled with red bone marrow, and we have accomplished our goal. We have made a mature diaphysis. Right? Just like good old George, we get to stand on that air freighter and say, mission accomplished. Except the mission isn't really accomplished. We still have some more work to do. All right, and that more work involves up here doing something with these epiphyses. Now, of course, are we gonna fix these epiphyses right away? No. No. That development of that secondary ossification center, that development of the epiphysis doesn't happen till either right before, or in some cases, like in the fingers, it happens right after birth. Again, it is a similar process at the beginning. This is the one thing I really don't like from your, uh, from your uh, picture from your textbook. Again, these metaphyseal blood vessels that grow in, grow in more from the metaphysis, from the neck of it, not just straight across from the outside. But again, that's all right. We can uh, allow our artist a little bit of artistic license. But again, chondrocytes are gonna enlarge, they're gonna die. A blood vessel grows into the area, brings new chemical signals, brings osteoblasts, and we form a small chunk of spongy bone in the two epiphyses. And what do we call these two clusters of spongy bone inside of the two epiphyses? Secondary ossification centers. There you go. These are our secondary ossification centers. Excellent. So those first three steps start the same. Kill off the chondrocytes, grow in a blood vessel, start making bone. But here is where our secondary ossification center or the development of our epiphyses change. Those are the three things they have in common. What are the two things that are gonna be different? The epithelial no. plate. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Emily, what were you saying? I was gonna say there's no medullary cavity. Excellent. There you go. You guys hit both of them. The two things that are going to be different is this time we don't hollow out the spongy bone. We leave the spongy bone and we leave some of the hyaline cartilage. We don't convert all of the cartilage into bone. All right. So here we maintain the spongy bone. We don't uh, remove it to form a medullary cavity. It stays spongy bone in the center and we leave hyaline cartilage in two places. One of the places that we are going to put that hyaline cartilage or leave the hyaline cartilage is on the outer surface. It forms the articular cartilage that allows us to form a joint. And the other place we leave it is in the metaphysis. And there in the metaphysis, it forms the epiphyseal plate, which as we talked about is how we grow the bone in length. And just that simply, we have converted a cartilage model into a bone. We have completed our process of endochondrial ossification. All right. Now, again, remember one of the big differences we talked about between cartilage and bone is that bone is very vascular. And notice we've seen that. Not one, not two, but three different blood vessels grew into three different locations. One grew into the perichondrium, which became the periosteum. One grew into the diaphysis and one grew into the epiphyses. And do you think these blood supplies stay separate from each other? No. no. Notice as we form that into our now completed bone, those blood vessels all grow into each other. Notice we have 
that nutrient artery coming in the diaphysis, the metaphyseal arteries coming in the neck region. And even here, we see those periosteal vessels. They all intermix. They all uh, go all together, giving this this big, huge, dynamic, heavily vascularized structure. And of course, remember everywhere that these blood vessels go, our nerves and our lymphatic vessels follow as well. So not only does our bone very dynamic, uh, has a great vascularization to it, but it also hurts like heck when we break it as well. Awesome. Questions on that? Yes. Um, so we've talked about the periosteum. Is there a different point when the endosteum grows in? So great question. Oh, excellent question. Yes. So you are right. As the um, medullary cavity is hollowed out. Oh, that's not going to work. As the medullary cavity is hollowed out, those same cells that bring in the bone marrow are also going to bring in the cells that are going to form the endosteum in there as well. So yes, when the bone marrow is forming is when the endosteum will form in there as well. Great question. Yep. All right. Awesome. Any others? All right, that is growth process one. Let's talk growth process two. Growth process two is intramembranous ossification. Again, let's do this on the whiteboard first. I'm 99% sure I've saved this because I think someone mentioned it, but I'll save it a second time just to make sure before I clear it. And we are now talking about intramembranous ossification. Remember, with intramembranous ossification, we are forming bones inside of a, a fibrous membrane or inside of a fibrous connective tissue. Remember, endochondrial is how we form most of the bones. Intramembranous ossification is how we form many of the flat bones uh, and irregular bones, especially the flat bones of the skull. So there's some other ones as well, but definitely most of the flat bones of the skull are formed this way as well, like the flat bones of the skull, mandible, uh, et cetera. Excellent. And again, we're forming inside of a fibrous connective tissue. So let's draw a fibrous connective tissue. We know this fibrous connective tissue is going to have collagen fibers. So what color do I want to use for these? We'll go ahead and start with blue. There you go, that's a good start. And not surprisingly inside of here, I think we used purple before, so we'll stick with that. Uh, we are gonna have a bunch of mesenchymal cells. So again, that's a good starting point. Do some quick labeling. Collagen fiber and a mesenchymal cell. So this is our starting point. So in this case, as we know, mesenchymal cells can divide to become any number of things. And what's going to happen first, we have to make this a little smaller to fit it all in. Uh, some of the mesenchymal cells will divide and make clusters of osteoblasts. So what's going to happen is this mesenchymal cell is going to divide. When it divides, it's going to produce new cells, and it is going to start to produce a cluster of osteoblasts. As we know, osteoblasts make matrix. And when they make that matrix, they surround themselves with matrix till they mature into an osteocyte. And so what ends up happening is I get this little cluster 
of bone that starts to form. And guess what we call a little cluster of bone that starts to form? Osteon. Well, remember, uh, we haven't quite organized it into an osteon yet. The ossification center? Exactly. We call it an ossification center. Now, remember, with endochondrial, we gave them names, primary and secondary, because they came in a particular order. Now, am I going to be able to make a flat bone like my parietal bone of my skull with uh, just a single cluster of bone? Do you think one single ossification center? No. No, absolutely not. Uh, so many are going to form. And are they going to be like dominoes where one forms first and then the second and then the third and then the fourth and then the fifth in kind of a domino fashion? No. no, as it turns out, no. So what ends up happening is not just one, but many ossification centers form. And since many are forming all at about the same time, we're not going to worry about sequential names. We're just simply going to call them ossification centers. So an ossification center forms there, another ossification center forms here, another ossification center forms here, another one 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 here, and so on and so forth. All these different ossification centers, many ossification centers are going to form. Now, as these many ossification centers start to form, these ossification centers expand. And as, well, this is an adult in cap still. And as they expand, they grow layers of matrix that expand towards the other other ossification centers. Now, as we know, this is not going to be forming perfectly, precisely arranged bone. So again, this is going to be forming layers of spongy bone. And what do we call the layers of, what type of layers of lamellae form spongy bone? Aculae. Uh, true, we are gonna get there eventually, but when we, what type, so we are gonna form the trabeculae, absolutely. The organizing structures uh, that are the trabeculae. And what type of layers of matrix are they made up of? Lamellae. What kind of lamellae? Remember, lamellae is, is coming through. Is it interstitial? There you go. Excellent. And so that's what's going to start to happen. We are going to start to get the irregular formations of layers of lamellae, the interstitial lamellae that are going to form the irregular points and processes that form our trabeculae. And so we're going to get start to get this formation of these trabeculae that are going to start to form within this area. All right. So now we're starting to form all these interstitial lamellae. The interstitial lamellae are growing into each other forming our trabeculae, forming spongy bone, right? So we get this formation of spongy bone. Now, there are two important things that are going to start to happen as these trabeculae form. First, notice trabeculae, as we know, have spaces in between them. And we don't like spaces. So not surprisingly, blood vessels are going to start to grow into these spaces. And as blood vessels grow into these spaces, we're going to start to fill this space with spongy bone. And because it was also reminded me of that, we are also going to fill 
this space with our endosteum as well. So blood vessels grow into the spaces between the trabeculae. And as they grow into the spaces between the trabeculae, red bone marrow forms in those spaces. But notice also, as this is expanding out, what's going to start to happen is those collagen fibers are going to start to be condensed down as it pushes up. It's going to start condensing those collagen fibers along the outer surface. And so we're going to get this irregular arrangement of collagen fibers, dare I say even a dense irregular connective tissue forms on the outer surface. And what might we call this dense irregular connective tissue that forms on the outer surface? Periosteum. Yeah. Our periosteum forms. Now notice, as it is condensing down these collagen fibers, we are also going to be capturing our mesenchymal cells under the periosteum. And now that they're under the periosteum, we are going to start to form more regular layers of compact bone on the inner surface of that periosteum. And of course, as we know, since we're forming a flat bone or an irregular bone in this process, this thin layer of compact bone that is being formed on the outer surface, we would call the cortex. Excellent. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Notice for the most part, this is kind of what we expect the anatomy of a flat bone or an irregular bone to be. A thin layer of compact bone on the outer surface, trabeculae on the inside. And of course, if this is a flat bone, remember what's the fancy word we would call these trabeculae if this was a flat bone? Diploe. Diploe, excellent. Excellent, are forming. So really for the most part, our anatomy of this is complete. Except for one thing. What are the chances that the random arrangement of these ossification centers that formed give us the exact shape of the bone we want? Not good. Yeah, not good. So while we have basically the form of a spongy bone here, uh, of a flat bone here. What we need to do now, the last step, is going to be to remodel the bone into the shape we want, right? And luckily, we could probably figure out how to do that. If, for instance, we needed to add bone in a location, what kind of cells would be useful for something like that? Osteoblasts. Osteoblasts. And if we needed to remove bone in a location, what cells would be useful for that? Osteoclasts. There you go. So using osteoclasts and osteoblasts, we have the ability to be able to there and there. If we needed to narrow the bone in this region, we could use our osteoclasts to break the bone down in this region. 
and that would allow us to change the shape, giving it more of an indentation there if need be. If we needed to add more bone on the outer surface here, we could do that with our osteoblasts. So in this fashion, we are able to change the bone into the precise shape that we want. And that is how we do intramembranous ossification. Notice, as I said, it's not as elaborate of a process, but that's because these flat bones, these irregular bones, are not as elaborate in their anatomy as the long bones are. So not surprisingly, it's a little bit of a simpler process. Again, I'll go ahead and save this drawing and add it, but I'm not sure this is necessarily as nice, excuse me, as the previous one, but Let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Make sure we understand this. Notice here, again, your book does this great job of showing all the collagen fibers, showing the mesenchymal cells, showing us this fibrous connective tissue, where we're gonna form flat bones of the skull, where we're gonna find mandibles, things like that. Again, no cartilage with this one, just this fibrous connective tissue. And of course, the first thing that happens is that, and again, we want to emphasize it, many ossification centers, plural, are going to form by having some of these mesenchymal cells divide to form our immature osteoblasts. And osteoblasts, of course, B for blast, B for build. And that is what they're going to do. They're gonna to start to make matrix. And as they make matrix, they surround themselves with matrix and they mature into an osteocyte. So our ossification center forms. We start making those interstitial lamellae. That are gonna give us those irregular trabeculae. Uh, from those interstitial lamellae. So again, they're surrounded by matrix, they mature into osteocytes, and they start expanding outward, forming irregular interstitial lamellae to form irregular trabeculae. Here, we're just looking at one ossification center that is growing but remember many of them form. And so as they grow and expand, we start to get the formation of that core of spongy bone. What eventually will become, again, since most of these are flat bones, oops, that quote unquote diploe is going to form. And notice also, as these trabeculi, as this spongy bone is forming, there are two other important things that are happening. The first is that our blood vessels are growing into these spaces within the trabeculi, depositing the endosteum, depositing the red bone marrow. And notice also here on the outside, even though our artist has removed the collagen fibers, we can see how those collagen fibers are condensing the mesenchymal cells on the outer surface. So they are forming our periosteum. So again, our blood vessels invade and we form that periosteum on the outer surface. The advantage of the periosteum is now we have those mesenchymal cells better arranged. And now that they're better arranged, we can start producing more precise layers of compact bone on the outer surface. So we get this layer of compact bone, remember what we call our cortex, forming on the outer surface, as I mentioned, our diploe forming on the inside, and then using our osteoblasts and our osteoclasts, we have the ability 
to remodel this bone. So if we have to narrow it in one region or expand it in another region to make it the shape we want. We can use osteoclast to break the bone matrix down and osteoblast to build up more in the area that we need to make that bone into the shape we want. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So that is the process of intramembranous ossification. Again, questions on this, do we understand this? Excellent. So now we have two related processes that I guarantee are essay questions in your test bank for this next exam. I, so I guarantee some of you are gonna be required to describe intramembranous ossification. Some of you are gonna be required to describe endochondrial ossification. And some of you are going to be asked to compare the two, right? Now, obviously there are many ways that they're similar. They both make ossification centers. They both make compact bone. They both make spongy bone. So instead, let's focus on comparing them, contrasting them, right? What are the major differences? Um, substance they develop from. Okay, hold on. I, I, I appreciate the enthusiasm, but let me uh, finish writing this down first. Excellent. Again, remember, you are not required to do it this way on the exam, but I find it useful because it helps me to organize my thoughts better. Obviously, we want to compare endochondrial and intramembranous ossification. But for me, at least, to help me organize it, I also like to think of the characteristic that I am comparing the two to make sure that I am comparing apples to apples. So again, I think, Emily, you were saying something. What's one of the differences that you saw between these two processes? The substance that they developed from. Excellent. Excellent. I like that. The substance, or we could just simply say the starting point. Excellent, of course, uh, let's make this smaller so I have more room to play. Substance or starting point. What is the starting point for endochondrial ossification? Hyalin cartilage. Hyaluronic. Excellent. And what is our substance for starting intramembranous? Fibrous connective tissue. Fibrous connective tissue. Excellent, and it looks like Samuel had the same idea, spectacular. Excellent. So, and again, notice here, Samuel, and again, I don't want to call you out on this, but but uh, I think this is a great example of one of those things that people sometimes, oh, what happened? Where did it go? So it's in a fibrous connective tissue, right? When you're doing a comparison, saying something is something and something is not is truly a comparison, but it is a better comparison to say that endochondrial ossification uses hyaline cartilage and intramembranous uses a fibrous connective tissue. So that way you're actually saying what both of them does. So again, you absolutely have the right idea, but it's always better to be more specific. Instead of just saying it doesn't, say what it does instead. I think that that's a great way to do it. So it's a way of taking it that next step to make sure you're maximizing your points. Excellent. What's another big difference? Medullary cavity. Okay, excellent. Perfect. Uh, so uh, so here, now again, now that I've said that, this is exactly going to be the opposite of that. Medullary cavity, os, off of, os, uh, obviously in endochondrial ossification, we are going to form one. Whereas here in our intramembranous ossification, uh, it stays 
bungee bone in the center. So it doesn't have a medullary cavity. Excellent. Give me another difference. There's at least one more super easy one. Uh, the formation of Ephesus. The heads. Okay. I, I see where you're going with this. So yes, but we can even we can simplify that even more. What type of bone is formed by endochondrial ossification? Long bone. Most, but long bones in particular, which those have the epiphyseal ends of them, absolutely, and a diaphysis. Whereas intramembranous primarily forms what type? Irregular. Yeah, well, oh, flat. Okay, flat. Flat and irregular. Right. And we, even here, we can say some flat and irregular bones. Excellent. All right. But there are a lot more. Give me another one. What's another big difference? Well, here, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the characteristic and you remodeling. tell me how... I'm sorry? Remodeling. Remodeling. Well, but both kind of are going to need to do some remodeling, right? I mean, obviously, we because that is that highland cartilage necessarily going to be the perfect shape for what we want? Perfect shape of a femur at the start. So yeah, there will be some remodeling that has occurs, to, occurs with both of them. But I like where you're going with that. But there's some other ways that are different. Here, let's start with another easy one. Endochondrial ossification and intramembranous ossification are both different in when the blood vessels grow in. In endochondrial ossification, when do the blood vessels grow in in relation to bone formation? What happens first? Blood vessel grow in or bone form first? Blood vessel grows in. Vessel. Yeah. So notice with endochondrial ossification, blood vessels grow in first, then the bone forms. Is that what happens in intramembranous ossification? No. No, here the bone forms first, then the blood vessels grow in. All right, so that's a big difference. What about formation of the periosteum? We could also think in terms of the perichondrium. What happens first here with endochondrial ossification? Do we have a perichondrium first or periosteum first and then bone? Or is there bone and then the periosteum? Periosteum, perichondrium. Yeah, you're first. right. This one's a little bit trickier because you're right. We have the perichondrium, that dense irregular connective tissue is there first. Then the bone forms. And is that the same for intramembranous ossification? No. Brain no, forms again. causing yeah. the. All right. So notice this is the type of stuff I'm looking for. When I ask you to do these types of comparisons, uh, this is what we're looking for here. Right? Uh, again, timing of the process. This one starts earlier typically. But more importantly, there is a gap in the process. Right? There's a difference between when we develop the perios uh, when we develop the diaphysis from the epiphyses, whereas intramembranous is more of a continuous. And I'm sure there's a half dozen more ways we could talk about them. Hey, yeah, absolutely. Here we get the formation of diploe, right, within the long bones, I mean, the flat bones, whereas we don't use that term on the, uh, on, uh, you know, the long bones and stuff like that. Like I said, I'm, I'm sure there are easily a half dozen different other examples of this. And like I said, you're not required to write them this way, but, you are required to compare them. 
If I ask you to describe four differences between endochondrial ossification and intramembranous ossification, you can't just describe endochondrial ossification and describe intramembranous ossification and be done with it. I want direct comparisons. And I want direct comparisons. Don't tell me that endochondrial ossification starts with hyaline cartilage and intramembranous is a continuous process. While both of those are true facts, that's not sh a comparison. That's not showing me the difference. All right. And again, if I ask for four, make sure you give me four. Saying that uh, endochondrial ossification starts in hyaline cartilage and intramembranous starts in a fibrous connective tissue is just one comparison. Yes, you're making two statements, but you're comparing those two statements. So that is only one comparison. That is not two comparisons. So make sure you give me four comparisons if I ask for four. Three comparisons if I ask for three. Again, that's another one of those places where I noticed people, uh, some people on the last exam needed to compare epithelial tissues and connective tissues, right? And you had, I think, three or four that you had to give me. Some people did a really good job of giving me one or two, but some people also just told me that epithelial tissues line surfaces and connective tissues uh, can transport oxygen. Again, while those are true statements, they're not a comparison. So again, having this to help, even if you're just doing it in your notes to help you organize it for you, it helps me to make sure that I am comparing apples to apples. So make sure you do that on the exam as well. I absolutely positively guarantee all three of these are gonna be essay questions that are in the test bank on your exam. And again, you're randomly assigned. So I honestly have no idea who's getting what, but I guarantee these questions are in there. And some of you are gonna get all of these. Well, not all of them, but some of you are, everybody's gonna get likely one of these. All right, questions on that? Nope. Excellent. That is what we needed to cover for today from a lecture standpoint. Again, we're finishing lecture early because we have our group presentations. Uh, let me do this first before I forget. Excellent. It is now set up that anybody can share uh, their uh, screens because that's gonna be beneficial. So it is 1020 right now. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to divide you up into your groups and put you in your breakout rooms uh, so that you'll have a chance to discuss. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I think we're it's just the first three groups that are going today. Today, we're going to do the skull only. So if you are one of the skull bones you are presenting today, uh, so you'll definitely want to prepare that. The rest of you can still work on your other material and if you have questions and things like that. There's also one group I need to meet with briefly, uh, so we will do that. I wanna give you a little bit of time for that, but I also wanna give you a chance to have a break. So since it is uh, 10.20 now, let's go ahead and give you 10 minutes to prepare and a 15 minute break. So let us uh, meet back. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll close the group rooms. at 10.45 and at 10.45, uh, I will do a quick intro. And then from there we go into the groups. And again, whoever's got the frontal bone, uh, you are going first. All right, questions on any of that? All right, excellent. It's gonna take me a minute to get you guys broken into your groups. So if you wanna go take your break first and then come back, uh, that is fine. Give me two minutes to get everybody organized and set up. So let me get those breakout rooms set up and then I'll meet you back here at 1045. So let me go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs> 